Welcome to lecture 10, Design Patterns. Uh, the first of two lectures on design patterns. Uh, this week we're going to look at uh, some ways in which we can organize the code. And uh, next lecture we'll look at some um, design patterns for organizing the way in which we interact with the data. So, uh, first of all, a little introduction to what we mean by design patterns. Uh, design patterns really describe general solutions to general problems. And I, I describe it like that because there are problems that can occur in all kinds of different settings. So we might need to sort through some data, and that might be in a filing cabinet, or it might be in a database, or some other way, and some other location, some other context. We might need to uh, iterate through a data collection that perhaps has got an unknown structure. Or uh, we might need some mechanism whereby an object-oriented application can interact with a relational database without necessarily having to bury all the uh, relational database commands, the SQL, inside the object-oriented code. Now, there are all kinds, lots and lots of uh, general problems. And so a design pattern is a solution to a specific problem, although the problem is described in general terms. And what we can do is take the design pattern, having identified that it actually, the problem we're looking at in the real world is some kind of variation of the general problem. We can take the design pattern that fits that general problem take its solution and then adapt it so that it fits our specific real-world problem. And that should help us to do uh, a few things. First of all, um, it will help us by giving a name to the pattern. I'll come back to why that can be helpful a bit later. It can help us in um, understanding a little better the problem that this pattern addresses because the pattern will have a description of the problem in general terms. The pattern will also have a general solution for the general problem, and there might be some consequences, some side effects of using that solution, and uh, those will typically be uh, elucidated in the description. Now, of course, being a general description, we've got to take the pattern and customize it to satisfy the specific requirements of the specific instance that we're dealing with of the general problem. Uh, and so it's not just the case of, oh, I'll use pattern X. It won't work that way. We have to tailor it to our specific needs. So why bother doing this? Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, these design patterns haven't just come out of some a uh, person's mind uh, because they think it's a good idea. These are actually tried and tested ex um, techniques that have been used in an industrial setting in many kinds of areas and therefore they are trustworthy. We can use them confident that they will provide a good solution. Not only that, but because they are successful, and that's why they've been uh, uh, published as a design pattern, these designs are successful in solving the problem, but they're also well-structured, which means that our designs become easier to uh, define and to follow. And therefore, of course, the knock-on effect of that is that the code will be easier to write, easier uh, to maintain as well and to debug. Another thing that can happen sometimes is that a design pattern will uh, highlight some good alternatives because sometimes you might have a particular problem but there might be two or three different patterns that could be used to solve the problem and therefore you might get some comparison between the, uh, the design patterns. If you're using a design pattern, then the chances are you're going to improve your system documentation and uh, certainly improve the maintenance because a design pattern 
if, you, if a designer is familiar with that pattern, that designer will immediately be able to uh, follow the design. Because knowing that it's a command pattern will mean that the designer is able to look out for a certain structure. So, uh, for example, uh, a designer A uses the command pattern, for example, and then leaves the company. Six months later, 12 years later, whatever it might be, the documentation is still available. Design, designer B comes along having to do a bit of maintenance or enhancement. And there's a note in there to say, this application uses the command pattern. Designer B immediately knows what the command pattern is and therefore has instantly some correct expectations of what to find in the design and in the code. And so what we'll find then is that design patterns become a lexicon, a vocabulary for design, and this aids communication. Not only does it aid communication between one designer and the next who are separated by time, but also for designers who are working together on the same project, they can talk about the command pattern or the template pattern or whatever, and so long as both are conversant with what these patterns are, then it's a, it's a very good abstraction for uh, talking knowledgeably and informatively about a design. Now a framework, and we've been using a framework since we've uh, started work on this module, a framework usually incorporates design patterns. Um, for example, if we were, as we did in the, the last uh, lecture, use um, the Java Graphics API to develop a, um, a graphical user interface. If we're writing that kind of an application, then we'll find that design patterns are, are littered all over the place. You can hardly look in a, uh, at a class in the, in the standard Java environment without finding a pattern of some sort, an observer pattern, a composite pattern, an iterator, and so on. Lots and lots and lots of patterns. Now, our internet applications have been using a subset of the Java Enterprise Edition API. And this uses design patterns as well. The framework sometimes will impose a design pattern upon our applications. And other times we are free to adopt patterns that we want to make use of. Here's one that's imposed as an example, although strictly speaking you don't have to uh, use it, I guess, but uh, um, the way we've been writing our applications, you could say, if you like, that I've imposed the pattern on you without you even realising it. Um, the front controller pattern. Now, the front controller design pattern will act as a centralised entry point that controls and manages requests. So all the requests come in to the front controller. Front, because it sits right at the front, it's the first and perhaps only point of contact for clients to access the functionality that's provided. So the front controller sits at the front, receives all the requests, and then will control the components of the underlying system um, by invoking appropriate responses to the requests. And of course, that should be really familiar to you because that's what we've been doing with our controller servlets. So we could say then that the control servlets that we've been writing are in fact implementations of the front controller pattern. Now if we were to look at the pattern description, which you can find on the URL that's listed at the bottom of the screen, uh, we'd find that there are certain participants. The client. Well, this is the uh, program, web browser, Java application, whatever it might be, but this is the program that submits the request to the front controller. The controller is the control servlet in our applications. The dispatcher is what will um, manage the invocation of the other components. So, uh, and in our examples, uh, the request dispatcher is what the controller has been using to dispatch uh, the request and, and move it on to other components. We also have the view, which of course is our view servlet or view Java server page. And then 
we've got lots of other classes that are known as helpers that exist to help the controller and the view to do their job. So these will be model servlets, beans, and any other Java uh, class that we would in, in, um, create for the purposes of this application. So you can see then that we have been using the front controller pattern and we have got all the participants necessary. The facade design pattern takes a slightly different approach. This one will provide um, a, an interface, a set of methods, that provide high-level functionality. And the purpose of this is to minimize communication between the client and the underlying system. So we could, for example, if we weren't using the facade pattern, we might find that um, some application that we'll call A would have to make several calls. Um, we'll call this um, functionality 1, F1, and then to functionality 2, and functionality 3, and would have to call them in the right order, at the right time, to get the right result, and so on. Now, that's all low-level interaction between the client, application A, and the functionality that's provided by the server. Now, if we were going to provide a facade, then what we would do instead is have application A talk to the, uh, I'll call it F for facade, and all interaction between A and the server goes via F. And then F will invoke functionality 1, functionality 2, functionality 3, in the right order, at the right time, to achieve the right results. And what this does is immediately remove from application A the requirement to know anything about the underlying uh, system that provides functionalities 1, 2, and 3. So we've got a separation now. The knowledge of the underlying system no longer has to be buried in, implemented in, application A. All application A has to do now is just talk to F, and F has got all that knowledge. So we're separating client from server. And that's a good thing to do. And so in a sense, we could also say then that the control servlets that we've been writing are also implementations of the facade pattern because they are the single point of contact for our clients and then they are invoking the necessary components in the underlying system. And... Uh, we could further reduce this, uh, adjust it rather, to reduce the dependency on subcomponents. Um, and we'll perhaps see some example of that a little bit later. In the pattern, the facade pattern, we have got simply two participants, or rather two types of participant. We have the facade, and then we have the subsystem classes, which in our internet applications are the other uh, servlets. Uh, whether they be control, model, or view. The template method, uh, as a design pattern, will define the outline of an algorithm, some parts of which are implemented in the template, and other parts of which are deferred or delegated to subclasses. And uh, the control service that we've been writing although not yet, our template method could be. And so we'll uh, just take a look in here now at the example, the template method example. The only thing really we need to look at is the source code. Um, the servlets, as you can see here, uh, I'm going to open up the super controller the controller and one of the subcontrollers. So let's take a look at the supercontroller first. This is uh, the template. This is a very simple algorithm actually because the algorithm is if the request is a post request then the do post method will be called. 
If the request is a get request, then the doGet method will be called. And in both cases, they're going to call the process request method. So that's the algorithm. And the algorithm has been embodied in this template. It's a regular Java class. Um, and so we find then, and because this is a servlet, because this is, it, this is the tailoring, you remember I was saying that we need to customize? Well, here we're customizing the general uh, pattern, the general solution, so that it fits our internet application context. And therefore, we need a servlet. So the class is going to extend HTTP servlet, is going to override do get and do post. And both of these are going to call process request. Now, process request is the part of the algorithm that isn't yet known. This is the bit that varies according to the situation we're in. And therefore, we're going to make this method abstract, which means we have to make the class abstract. Now, abstract means no implementation exists in this class. And therefore, instead of having a method body with open brace, close brace, and some statements, we've just got a semicolon. There's no method body for that um, abstract method. Which means then, because the class is abstract, we cannot instantiate that class directly. And therefore, we're going to have to write subclasses. So let's take a look at the controller then. This is... Uh, a controller, that's the name of the class, extends supercontroller. So it immediately inherits all the stuff from supercontroller, in other words, the do post and the do get method, and it is required to implement the process request method. And therefore, what we've got is the method body with everything that we would normally expect to see. And then it's invoking other controllers. Now, this is a slightly different approach. For example, if the request has a command value that has a, uh, the value is all employees, then we're going to set up the request dispatcher to hit the subcontroller all employees, which is this one. So you'll notice then that what the controller is doing is simply dispatching to a subcontroller. Now this, this is a good thing to do in some ways because what's going to happen is that if you imagine you've got thousands and thousands of clients all around the world and they're all hitting this one servlet. Now that's going to cause quite a, a workload. And so what we want to do is to get, get the request in and out of this servlet as quickly as possible so that we're not degrading performance too much. So what we're going to do then is to set up subcontrollers. So all the code that used to be under the uh, if uh, statement, all inside this body here, that's all been taken out of there and put into the subcontroller class. So all of that kind of stuff would originally have been in the controller. That's now been extracted. So that the controller identifies which subcontroller needs to be invoked and then forward. So it straight away will mean that this servlet has finished dealing with the request. Control is not going to come back here, so this servlet is now um, no longer processing the request. Gets rid of the request as quick as possible. And now the subcontroller is able to deal with it uh, in exactly the same way as we have been used to doing. The uh, effect of that, if we took, take a look in here, is that we've now got a subcontroller for each of our transactions that the user could invoke. The, uh, um, so that's using the template method uh, design pattern. There's something else that I want to show you as well. In the, in the model, um, what I've done is created a, a package for just the model uh, servlets. One of the reasons for that is because I wanted to uh, 
uh, uh, have a package where all the model components sit together. It helps in terms of navigating around the, the project. And so we've got, for example, get all employees. Now, what we had before was all the SQL statements that were necessary embedded inside the code for that model component. And that can be a bit of a problem. Let's imagine that we've got a very large application. And there's lots of database interaction. And therefore, if we had, let's say, two or 300 model components in our very large application, then there would be perhaps thousands of SQL commands dotted around inside these hundreds of model components. And that, that would make debugging difficult. It would also make uh, the optimization of the database rather difficult. For example, the, the database administrator for this very large application might want to have a list of all the SQL commands that are used within the application so that he or she can then uh, take a look at these, optimize them, maybe make some stored procedures and so on. And uh, that is really a bit of a pain, especially if the developer says to the database administrator, well, OK, well, here are my two or 300 model components. You look through those and find the statements. I would imagine that the database administrator would not be very really uh, very impressed. So what can we do instead? Well, one thing we could do is to have a separate class, which is actually an interface, so public interface, and then give it a name, I'm calling it SQL statements, in which we declare string variables. And each string variable has a name, of course, and contains the SQL command associated with that, that name. So all employees is select, uh, and then the, the columns from the table, order by, and so on. And in this one, this is going to be used as part of a prepared statement. I know that because, look, there's a placeholder, question mark. So it's going to be a, used as a prepared statement. Now, the advantage of doing this is that we've got all the SQL statements in one place. Now, that makes it easy from our point of view because we know exactly where to look if there's a problem. But also, it makes it easy for passing on the information to the database administrator. Here is one class with all 300 or 4,000 um, commands in there, SQL commands. So what do we do then? If we've written this interface with all those commands, SQL commands in there, then all we've got to do in our servlet, the model servlet, is to implement that interface. And that will immediately make available to this class all those SQL commands, because the variables declared in that interface become available to this, uh, this class here. And therefore, when we come down to here, prepare statement, there's the variable all employees, which of course is this one here, select emp, emp no, emp name, ename rather, and job from emp, and so on. So that's a, a quite a useful thing to do as well. What have we got then as participants in the template method? We've got the abstract class, which is the class that implements as much of the algorithm as can be done. And the bits that can't be done are made abstract methods. And then the concrete class, which essentially is the subcontroller, that provides the uh, concrete implementation of the abstract method um, in, the, in the abstract class. So it's a fairly simple approach to, uh, uh, to use. Now, the command pattern. I mentioned this very uh, early on in today's lecture. Um, the command pattern is, uh, again, fairly straightforward. What it does is encapsulates a user command as an object. And then that command can be executed. 
one of the big advantages of this is that we are then able to issue commands without knowing anything about the request or its recipient. Um, and what we shall do in the next example is to uh, rewrite those subcontrol servlets that we were looking at in the template method example. We'll rewrite those as commands. And then the control servlet simply needs to instantiate a command and execute it. And it doesn't have to know anything about the request type. It doesn't have to know anything about the, the kind of uh, object that uh, is being dealt with. It just instantiates the command, executes it, and then moves on to the next thing. The participants, then, are this. We need a command, which is an interface in our example, a concrete command, which is a class that implements that interface, a client, which is the command factory, so that's going to generate one of these um, commands and instantiate it. We need an invoker that is going to be the control servlet that will invoke one of those commands by using the factory. And then a receiver, which in our example is going to be the concrete commands. Don't worry too much about the names for now. Let's take a look at uh, how it will work. So in the command pattern example, again, we're only really interested in the source packages. And uh, a point that you might already have spotted here is that we're now starting to multiply the number of classes that we've got involved here. So our applications, although we're making use of these design patterns, are starting to multiply in, in the number of classes involved. But that doesn't really matter too much, especially if we organize them well with, with packages. The reason it doesn't matter so much is because by using the design pattern, we're, um, we're tying ourselves into an established way of doing things. And that means that our systems become easier to write because we're only looking at very small bits of the system at a time. And they're also easier to, to follow, to maintain, to debug, to enhance. These uh, patterns will very often lead to applications that are extensible. So we can keep adding things in by adding an extra command and an, uh, or an extra template and so on. Um, so having made that point, let's just focus on the controller for the first instance. Right, there's the do post, there's the do get, and here is the entire process request. All it does is to create a command, execute the command, and then hit the appropriate response. Where does the, uh, sorry, not, uh, hit the appropriate uh, view page. Where does the view page come from? Well, it comes from the execute. The command will tell this controller which uh, view to invoke. So let's have a look at how this is done. You can see that the first thing that the controller does is to access the command factory. So let's look at command factory. This has a static method and is used to create a command. So this is where the decision making is done about what kind of command to invoke. So this is as has been done in the past. You'll be familiar with this concept. The request is consulted. We get the parameter called command and then we test its value. If indeed it has a command and the command is not empty, then if the command is all locations, then we're going to create a new all locations command object. If it's all employees, then we'll in, uh, instantiate the all employees command and so on and pass in request and response. So the command is created. So let's take a look at one of those, um, the all employees command. To instantiate it, 
all it's going to do is store the request and the response in these variables here. Now, does that make them not thread safe? Well, let's take a look. That is being set up as a static thing, so it, it'll the thread when it gets in there is just going to come straight out. And even if it get, gets preempted, well, the variables that are used are all local to that method, and therefore they're going to be saved when the uh, the thread is kicked off the processor. Back in the controller, it's the same thing. We've got no variables up here. So the command itself is going to be saved as part of the state of this method when the thread is preempted. And therefore, it's quite safe to uh, have these variables out here. Then, back in the controller, the next thing that happens is, having created the command, the execute method is called. Well, how does the controller know that there's an execute method? Well, it's because this class implements the command interface. So if we take a look at the command interface, it's simply a public interface called command, and it has one method defined in there, execute. And therefore, because the controller is getting a command, which is of type command, it knows that there's going to be an execute method, so it can call it. It doesn't know what the implementation is. It doesn't even know what kind of um, command instance it's looking at. It doesn't matter, because it requires a command, and all employees command implements command, and therefore it is a command. So it, the controller calls the execute method, and what we had before as part of the controller is now put here inside the execute method. And what has happened here ha is that the uh, the model component has been invoked, the bean has been set up, and uh, is tested to make sure that it exists, and then the view all employees.jsp name is returned. Strictly speaking, it didn't have to do that. It could, because you can see that we've invoked, using the re request dispatcher, we've invoked the model, then we could, and maybe should, have invoked the view here. The advantage of invoking the view here is that the controller doesn't have to do it, and therefore it has much less to do uh, in terms of processing things. Um, so I think on reflection, I would probably prefer to take the lines here, 18 and 19, from the controller and put them into the individual um, commands. So there's the command pattern in use. The use of the command pattern, a little bit more complicated in one respect, but also a lot easier in another. Take a look at the controller now. Very simple, very straightforward. What's a little bit complicated is taking the bits that used to be in the controller and scattering them around the other parts of the system. So the command part of deciding what type of uh, controller or subcontroller is needed. That's done here in the command factory. And then all the rest of it, which is what used to be the subcontroller in the uh, template method design pattern, that is now in the command inside the execute method. But in all other respects, this is pretty well just as you have been doing it for the last few weeks in this module. And uh, more details about all of these can be found at the, the URLs that are listed on these slides. And that's it for today. Enjoy attempting the use of design patterns in your tutorial.